again. Welcome to Reese G on the Real. And today I am getting real on the political side of things with Mike Miller, Register of Deeds for Charleston County. It's election season and uh, he's running for re-election. You've had some challenges though in this position, especially over the last year. Your name's been all up in the news, newspaper, TV. Oh yeah, they're in love with Michael Miller these days, that's for certain. Yeah, so you yeah. want to tell us about it? I mean, some of us already know, but give us some more in-depth detail that we probably don't know, and from your perspective, sure. as to which the challenges you faced over the last year in your position. So, I, I think some of the, the biggest challenges have been just um, the office being inundated with so much land transactions. Of course, my office, I know everybody knows, but the, the Register of Deeds office records all land transactions on all real property in Charleston County. So... Anytime you buy a house, sell a house, refinance your home, um, quick claim deed your property to somebody else, all of those documents are housed in my office for perpetuity, forever. Mm -hmm. And so Charleston County is a huge county and it's a very hot real estate market. Right now, last year around this time, Charleston was doing about 30% more in land transactions than any other county in the state. Wow. Um, Admits COVID. So even though COVID kind of shut the city down and cities down, states down for that matter, the housing market continued to shoot through the roof. Okay. And um, my office bared the brunt of all of that, of that work. My office generates an enormous amount of money for the county, obviously, mm -hmm. but still it is one of those essential offices that could not and cannot close regardless of anything. And so one of the challenges was, our biggest challenge in the last year was being able to deal with the, the sheer volume of all of the land transactions and we deal with COVID in my office. Um, the county had a, a, a COVID-19 protocol, which simply was if people had COVID tested positive out for 14 to 10 days, and even if you weren't feeling well, they wanted people to stay home just to keep customers and um, other employees and staff members safe. And so as we're trying to follow the COVID-19 protocols on top of dealing with the sheer volume of the work, when I got elected in 2018, we started serving January of 2019, um, I had a, uh, about 40% of the staff was about ready to retire. Oh, okay. And um, they came to me individually and said, Mr. Miller, you know, we're going to stay for about two years to kind of get you in your transition, but we're probably going to retire around 20, 2021. And so I was like, that's fine, because, you know, people work to retire. They, they spend 20, 30, 40 years. They want to get that gold watch and kind of go off to another aspect of their life. And so I was in some way getting prepared for that to transition and take place. What I could not see in January of 19 was COVID. That's it. Well, nobody saw that come. Right. And so when COVID hit, people, the older folks started retiring left oh, and yeah. right. And so between January... Between March of 19 and March of 2021, I lost about 300 years of institutional knowledge in the office. Okay. Um, which I think would be difficult for anybody or any entity or business to kind of deal with. But our office is even more difficult because it takes so long to train you to do this work. Okay. And so it takes four, five, six, seven, eight months, sometimes depending on the office, the, the department, a year to train you. And so... I'm dealing with the perfect storm. I'm dealing with COVID, people out sick, people retiring, low interest rates at less than 2%. People are buying and refinancing at an alarming rate. Charleston's a hot market anyway. And so it was just really difficult for me to kind of manage that. And so we got hit hard. And there's a 30-day mandate by the state that all documents, as they come into the office, must be recorded within 30 days. Okay. And for a long while, we just were not able to do that. Yeah. We just couldn't, not that we weren't trying. We were, we exhausted all of our overtime, weekends, coming in early. We just didn't have enough manpower to do it. Okay. And because our process is antiquated because we're all paper, um, it takes us longer to process the same document. There's a, there's a process called e-recording, electronic recording, which allows a lawyer to scan the document directly to my office. We can look at it. If it doesn't meet the state standard, we can send it back. We can reject it electronically. They can resubmit it to us. 
we can look at it if it's ready, we can click it, and then we can go through our process. It also allows everybody in the office to do every aspect of the work. In my office, everybody works in silos. So recorders only record, mm -hmm. imaging only do imaging, indexes only do indexing, mailback only does mailback. E-recording allows everybody to be cross-trained so they can do every aspect of the work. So somebody was like, well, how good is e-recording? I said, where are you from? Where are you from? Are you asking me? Yeah. What do you mean where I'm from? Where are you from? I'm from Charleston. No, you're not. Where are you from? <laughs> New York? You're from New York. Okay. The registered deeds in New York, her name is Annette. They do over 2 million documents a year in New York City. Their turnaround time is less than 48 hours. Wow. But they have e-recording. They have a system in place to... And e-recording e is efficient, it's quicker, it's faster, mm -hmm. it's um, it's more deliberate, it executes at an alarming fast rate with the same level of precision. And so e-recording is where I want the office to go. I couldn't go to e-recording. I'd already kind of started meeting with companies to get us moving in that direction when I first got elected. Because when I first got elected, we didn't have an issue with e-recording. We were with, with um, our delay in our processing. We were within 30 days of the 30-day mandate, but um, when people started retiring and COVID hit, it pushed us beyond the 30 days. And I'll tell you why later, why I couldn't go to e-recording when there's a delay in recording documents, but that's where okay. we're going to e-recording. Okay. So now you're back on track. You was able to get everything up to speed. Yes, and... yes. There's also um, a program called a fraud alert system. A fraud alert system is simply this. Michael Miller is logged into the fraud alert system at Charleston County Register of Deeds Office. If any document goes into that office with my name attached to it, I would get an email letting me know, hey, there's something going on with one of your properties. You might want to go check and see what's going on. Okay. So that, coupled with e-recording, is where I'm trying to go with the office. Okay. Because people are stealing property. Again, you don't steal property with a knife and a gun. You steal property with a pen. Okay. And yeah. when you steal it, it's recorded in my office. Now, as long as it meets the state standard, yeah. we have to record it. That's it. If I believe it to be fraudulent in any way, by state law, I cannot record it. But it has to fall into that category. If it meets the standard, we see we're going to record it. I don't know if it's fraudulent or not. Yeah. I don't know if you didn't sign it and somebody forged your name. I would have no knowledge of that. And so those are the kind of things that we're working on. Okay. Also, I want you, before we wrap it up, to share with people some information. Like, you just helped me know what I needed to do if I needed to look up some documents. But right. in your position, which have you learned that would be beneficial to people that needed to get deeds or information about property? Anything that you want to share that would be beneficial that you think that some people really don't know? And you want to just kind of give them more knowledge of so they can have a better understanding of how things work. And I know you mentioned how, earlier how we check our health and all these other things. But there's when it comes to real estate and property, we don't keep up with. Sure. So the first thing I would say to anybody who is a landowner and or tied to property is at least once a year, go to your county where your house is located and pull your deed in your plat. The plat is basically a map of the dimensions of your property, the footprint of your property, 50 feet by 100 feet. Um, that's important because, like I said earlier, you can steal property with a pen, not with a knife. And it's so interesting. The last two weeks, I've come across so many people who've come into my office to meet with me to help them figure out how people have been stealing their property without them selling it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Explain. Explain right. that. There's a process called adverse possession. Adverse possession simply means that you could become the owner of someone else's property by, in essence, taking care of it. So let's say the property next to yours is, and it's, it's usually not like in the rural parts of a town, but typically it is, or an area where it may be like a vacant lot or an abandoned home or something, usually not in neighborhoods, right? So you could, if the house, if the lot next to yours is vacated, 
nobody lives in it, and the house has been torn down. But because it's next to you and there's no fence, as the grass grows higher, Reese and her family, ain't, ain't, they're not cutting the grass because they don't live here. So I start cutting the grass, and I cut it every two weeks where I cut mine. And let's say I do that for years on end. And then I get to the point where you know I want some privacy, so I, I fence in both yards as if they're my yard. And I start to maintain the maintenance of that, of that yard. And then let's say every once in a while I go down to the tax office and I pay the property taxes on the property. Over time, I can go to a judge and ask the judge to allow me to become the owner of this property through adverse possession. Wow. And it happens all the time. That's what I was about to ask you. Do judges actually grant people? Yes. There's a process. The judge just doesn't give it. There's a process. The judge would have to put the information in the newspaper to allow the family members who own this property to come forward and say, Judge, we had no idea. We don't live in South Carolina anymore. We've been paying the property taxes on it. We received a couple bills with no, no due balance. And so we thought it might have been an oversight. But we still want to own the property. But the judge ultimately, we see, has the ability and the authority to make the decision. Mm, that's interesting. That is very interesting. So what about in the case of heirs' property? Okay. And you have... <laughs> oh, God. Sorry. I just had a... Uh-oh, what? I had a situation that happened this week somebody brought to me. Well, you want to share it? Sure. So you and I are brother and sister. We own... We own um, heirs' property together. Okay. It's in, it's in probate, which means our mother and father passed away owning property, and since their death, we never went to court to put the property in our name. Let me take a step back. You would think, if we're brother and sister, and our mom and dad own a house or property, and they die with no will, who gets the property? We do. Yeah. Why does it need to be probated to exactly. say that? But for legal purposes, that property must be probated into our name. Okay. So the, the grantor, grantee must change. In the event that that doesn't happen, property goes into heirs' property status, which means the descendants of the owners of that property now own the property, and not one of them have more rights than the other. I laugh when you said that because just this week, like last week, Somebody came to me and said, Michael, my sister sold our property. Wow. I said, wait a minute. You guys own property. It's heirs' property, right? She said, yes. I said, well, how did she sell it? She said, that's what we're trying to figure out. How could she sell the property when she wasn't the owner? Yeah. Because people falsify names. Wow. And some people will buy the property knowing it's an heirs' property status. Just so when it goes to court, they can then petition a the judge to get the other, other heirs to sell their percentage or just lose the property outright. Sell the percentage to them? Mm hmm So it's almost like they're doing it backwards. Kind of sort of. Okay. Wow. Uh, and that happens a lot as well. It does, unfortunately. Wow. I got another one better than that. I got an email this week from a gentleman who said he and his sister had some issues with their mom and dad's property. Said they went to the house. Somebody else was living in it. Well, who was that somebody else? Somebody they didn't know. They called the police. The police come out to, that res to the residence, ask the gentleman who's in the house, can he provide any documentation that gives him and grants him the right to live in the house? He showed them a falsified deed. So the gentleman emails me and says, Mr. Miller, how is that even possible? Yeah. So I get his address. I look it up. This guy's name is not on the property. But the guy paid the taxes. He showed the cops a copy of the tax bill. Oh, okay. But remember, just because you pay the taxes on the property does not make mm -hmm. you owner. So what happens when you have somebody that pays taxes on the property for years on end, although they don't own it as like an heir's property situation? How does that work out? If that person wants to claim the property, 
they can go to a judge and ask a judge to make a ruling and say, hey, look, I've been maintaining the property for X number of years. Although my siblings and I are heirs of the property, I believe I should have rights to the property. And a judge could ultimately make that decision. Really? That's interesting. Dude. Or they would ask, and most lawyers don't want to deal with heirs' property <laughs> issues because it's, it's, it's horrible. I mean, I've, in my three years of being in office, I could write a book on the horrible scenarios and family disputes as it pertains to heirs' property and family not wanting to sell not, or selling the property outright knowing they, they can't and then taking the cash. So what do they do in those situations? What does who do? If somebody sells a property knowing that they not the right, that they don't own it outright or whatever the case may be, and they done got a $300,000 for the property, like how do you resolve that after the fact? Ultimately, what I've seen in my office is, depending upon the income of the folks who are impacted, nothing. Because they can't, they don't have enough money to go to a lawyer to fight it. So the person just walks away? Uh-huh. But how are they able to sell it if their name is not on the, the there's ways around everything, huh? Okay. We're going to leave it like that. And it's unfortunate, but, but it happens more than people even realize and recognize even most times with family members yeah i mean i saved the young lady ten thousand dollars of legal fees because her aunt forged her name on a document and transferred the property from her to the aunt when she found out she came to my office pulled the deed and saw her her aunt's name on it and her aunt forged her name on the document so she went to the police filed a report found the she found the um the um the the person who does the um um I was blank on this term, I don't know why I do. The person who notarized the document, she found the person who notarized. Oh, okay. The police interviewed her and said, Did you witness two people make sign this document? She said, No. <gasps> she could lose her license to do it, right? She said, Well, why didn't you stop it? She said, I just didn't. She said, Where were you when you did this? We was on Spruill Avenue. In a, in, a, in, a, in a parking lot at a, at a convenience store and there was no penalty for that person for doing that. That's what I thought. I thought there was a penalty for that. She didn't have any. Luckily, the state law does allow me the opportunity if I find a document to be fraudulent. I can't take it off the rolls, Reese, because once it's recorded, it's there. But I watermarked it and then allowed them to make a to do a new deed, which put the property back in the original owner's property possession. Saved her $10,000 because that's what a lawyer was going to charge her. So most people, when they have these legal issues pertaining to property, they don't have the resources to fight it. Mm -hmm. So they have to, unfortunately, oftentimes they just have to kind of let it go. Wow. So that's why you say it's important to check every year. Every year. Even if you think, hey, I own the property, why should I have to check it? Shh. You don't know what shape these yeah. people are doing. What? <laughs> um, and, and I hate to say that people would have to do that. And I would have never known that unless I got in this position. I would have never thought that. I own property. My, my wife and I, we own property around town. And if you don't check it, when your house gets, when another bank takes up the mortgage on your property, that comes to my office too. So if Wells Fargo, if that loan gets purchased from Wells Fargo by Chase, Chase, Wells Fargo sends a letter to my office saying we're releasing the loan from Michael Miller, and Chase sends another letter saying we're not assuming that loan. Mm -hmm. So everything about your property is recorded in my office. Mm -hmm. Nothing's not recorded. Wow. That's why you got to check. That's why. So many different reasons. Yes. You should do it anyway, but I mean, most people gonna think I own it. What? Like, like my name's on the deed. And, and if I own it and I never sold it, yeah. Like, why would you think to check? Why would you think you would never think to check? Well, so you just schooling us today. He's schooling us today, y'all. I got That's one more, it. and I'm gonna let you go. You're a smart person. What happens to your property if you don't pay the taxes on the property? What happens to it? Um, it, um, uh, what's the technical term? Okay, if you don't pay your taxes, you could, it goes to auction. I don't, you know, I know. Delinquent taxes. That, that part, see, that's what it is. Yeah, right. that. What happens if it's not purchased 
in the delinquent tax sale? Do you know? No. Take a guess. If it's not purchased in the delinquent tax sale, yes. and you can't pay the taxes to And the nobody bank. in the auction purchases it. What happens to it? Does it go to the state or something? It goes to a commission. The commission is called the Forfeited Land Commission. Okay. Three people serve on the Forfeited Land Commission. Those three people are the county auditor, the county treasurer, and who's the third? Who's the third? Like a mayor or something. Now, who was the third? The county register of deeds. Oh, wow, really? And the three of us determine what happens to that property. We could sell it for a dollar, 50 cents. We could give it away. Wow. And so I guess you've experienced that. Since I've been on the commission, we, we've only had two, three pieces of property in it. But imagine what it was like 20 years ago. Mm. Learning a lot today. And so now you got the first black in this position ever who comes in out the gate going by the book. Mm -hmm. Reese, you've been here long enough to know the property in Charleston is going through the roof. Mm -hmm. You've also been here long enough to know about all of the stories we've heard about black people losing their property, people stealing property. Mm -hmm. Those are true statements. Mine have been going on for a long time. A long time. Well, you schooled us today in a major way. And hopefully you will have another term. Hopefully. To continue doing the work that you're doing. Hopefully. And, uh, yeah. That was, I'm, I'm speechless, y'all. That's some crazy, <laughs> that's, that's some crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, yeah, if anything, just be mindful of Checking on your property and yeah. Encourage your family members, mom and dad, grandparents to one, keep the property out of heirs property that. status. Yeah. Just do a will. Just do a will. I can't say just do a will because I don't make it sound so simple, but a will helps solve mm -hmm. so many issues down the road. It just it just does. Um, no, you're not going to be able to stop people from being criminal minded. That ain't going to yeah, ever happen. But at least right? you have some type of documentation or something to support yeah, yeah. and streamline things and make things less yeah. hectic and chaotic mm -hmm. and keeping property with this rightful owner's, yeah. in the rightful owner's bloodline. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to losing it. And, and everybody is something that even my own family is has been a victim of heirs' property. Luckily, it didn't turn out really bad for us, um, but we're still working on the property now in North Charleston, which is the reason why I ran for the office in the first place was because of issues with that property. Okay. And um, my grandfather died in 92, my man died in 88, the house still hadn't been probated. My uncle lives in it. My grandfather said, in my death, he gets the house. So he lives in it, he being my, un my, un my youngest uncle, but the house still hadn't been probated. Mm. They want to do it, but you know, there's other family issues and concerns and all these kinds of things. And so it's really difficult to navigate. I They bring me in because I have the documents. And look, I don't want to, don't really bring me in this, but they come because we have the documentation of what is and what is not. Yes. And I don't provide, you know, legal advice, which I can't in my profession. I can't even tell you which attorney you should go to. I can't do that either. I could just give you the documentation and say, look, I advise you to get an attorney to help you with your work. Yeah. So. And that can be very costly. Yes. Extremely costly. And go to somebody who you trust. That part. Because I got stories about that too. Well, I'm going to have to have you back on so you can share some more of these stories to help educate mm -hmm. the people out there because that is a major, major issue for many, many years yeah. with our people mm -hmm. losing property. Okay, so... Now, as we move forward into this new upcoming election, you're running and uh, you're hoping to be reelected. And if so, what are your plans so, for, as far as advancing it even further? So we, do, we still have a lot of obstacles in the office. I mean, I think we've made some really good gains so far. But like anything, there's always room for improvement. Okay. 
Um, so obviously the goal for me is to get reelected on Tuesday, June 14th. Please go vote. Michael Miller, Charles County. It's a primary, and so a lot so, of people typically don't vote in primaries. That's it. So you have um, some people running against you in the primary? I do. I have one person who's running against me in the primary. Okay. And um, this race will come down to race. Okay. To be honest with you. Point blank, Perry. Point blank. That's what it is. Okay. Um, and so if our people turn out like we normally do in primaries, and it's, it's sad because a lot of younger people under 45 typically don't vote in a lot of primaries. Yeah. Because a lot but, of people in, across the board don't vote in primaries. Right, that's, right. I mean, that's one of the major challenges. Yeah, there's that. voter apathy in every community. Folks in Mount Pleasant don't vote in, 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 in primaries either. So I don't want to yeah. say it's just a black issue. It's not. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it's pervasive. It goes mm -hmm. across the board. Um, and so the goal is to get as many people to turn out and vote on June 14th as they can or vote early because you can do that too. Mm -hmm. um, and if that happens, we continue to move the office forward. I still have positions I have to fill, people I have to cross train, still meeting with e-recording vendors and land record vendors because I can't just go to e-recording. It's not like a, a flip of the switch. Mm -hmm. You have to change everything about your process. And, and so that's not a two, three, four month kind of process. That's a six month to 12, 13, 18 month process. And, but I really do think that if the office were to move in that direction, it would really assist not just the office in terms of processing the documents, but even people like yourself who want to go in and look at a document and find something to have a process. Okay. All right. Well, look, we want to wish you all the best in this uh, upcoming election. That you'll get past the first step, the first hurdle, which is the primary. Right, first hurdle. And then you can move full steam ahead towards the general in November. Yes.